give me one shot here on a blue chip stock, believe me, Kevin, the only problem I'm gonna have is that you didn't buy more. Nobody knows if the stock is gonna go up, down, sideways, or in circles. What is going on, NBA draft fans? Your boys are back. The Wolves of Wall Street. Your favorite draft analyst's favorite draft analyst. It's the Draft Act NBA Draft Show. And my name is Corey Talba. Here, as always, with my co-host, Albert Garbage Time Gim. Albert, this is the last Draft Act episode of 2022. How we how we feeling? Wow. Well, number one, I had no idea that this was the last part of 2022. I I'm just absolutely losing track of time and where I am in the world um, every single day. But it's been an honor and it's been awesome to be able to do this this year. And we appreciate all our listeners for joining us throughout the year. And uh, I feel great. And Corey, I did want to say, I don't know what the hell happened, but your mic sounds unbelievable right now. Wow. And uh, yeah, the audio sounds incredible. So it's a great time for us to sound incredible because this is going to be a really, really big pod for us. I think I'm just leaning into the mic. Is what it is. I'm just got it. Getting real close. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be a fun episode, though, because uh, we are going to discuss Asar Thompson of the Overtime Elites City Reapers. He will be 20.4 years old on draft night. He is listed at six foot seven, 207 pounds, with a reported six foot 10 inch wingspan. He's playing 26 minutes per game, averaging 17.2 points per game, 7.8 rebounds per game, 5.2 assists per game to 2.9 turnovers, 2.8 steals, 1.4 blocks, shooting 51.8% from the floor, 33.3% from the three-point line, 63.6% from the free throw line. True shooting percentage of 58.3. Let's get into some preseason stock pricing. ESPN had him at eight preseason. SB Nation had him at four preseason. Basketball News at four. The Athletic at 10. Tankathon at eight. No ceilings at 12. Sports Illustrated at six. That is an average price of 7.4. He came in at number seven on the draft DAC. Stock IPO. Currently, ESPN has moved him up to five. The Athletic still at 10. Tankathon has moved him up to six. Basketball News still has him at four. Bleacher Report has him at six. Sports Illustrated has moved him down to eight. No Ceilings has moved him up to eight. That is an average price of 6.7. We'll see where he comes in on the next Draft Act stock rankings, which should be released, uh, I believe, next week to open up the new year. So, Albert, I ask you, as I always do for the last time in 2022, is Asar Thompson stock price too high, too low, or just right at 6.7? I'm going to say 6.7 is just right. And um, I, the, I think the basis for me of uh, me saying that it's just right is because I have him at seven on my personal board right now, which is actually a pretty big leap. Um, I believe on my first board, he was like in the teens somewhere um, and he's jumped up quite a lot. And after doing another deep dive, you know, preparing for this pod, I actually think like seven feels just about right. And I feel like I have him at a good spot. Um, obviously, things can change. But for where we are right now in this in the season, at this part of the season, I would say seven feels just about right. Uh, I would agree with that. I have him at six on my personal board. So that's right in between where we both have him. And, you know, Asar is a guy who's really grown on me, I think. You know, um, in, in the preseason when we did this, uh, I believe this is probably before I had actually seen him in person. So I've now gotten a chance to see him up close a couple of times now. And I, I, I feel good about how I've scouted Asar thus far this season. So moving on, if you had $10 to invest in Asar Thompson, Jet Howard, and Max Lewis, how would you spend your $10? I'm not going to go with the obvious guy to add into this mix. Jet, Asar, and Max Lewis. I, I do want to say, I, I think, Corey, you deserve a lot of credit um, because you have many gifts and talents. This might be one of the, the best things that you do because I don't know how you come up with these trios all the time that are so <laughs> difficult for me. Uh, but, okay, let's do this. Let's do this. Uh 
God, this is rough because I really like all three guys. And you and I had a conversation, uh, a very open and honest conversation about Max Lewis off air a couple weeks ago. So um, I, yeah, I was just there for his worst game. So I've been trying to fix that. I've been watching all his other stuff recently and like, I like him a lot. Okay, here we go. I'm going to go here. I'm going to give Osar $5 mm-hmm. because I, I really do think he's that damn good. I'm then going to go three. I'm going to go three to Max Lewis and two to Jed Howard. And that was really tough for me. But I, I want to lead. I want to lean a little bit more towards Max because I, I really like his game. So I I have. I split my $10 up the exact same way. And I think that we have upset Tyler Metcalf and maybe Maxwell um, on, on this one. Cause I know they've really, I mean, I like I love jet, you know, he he was a guy who I thought was way undervalued. I I think when I released my big board video, I had him at 19 to enter the preseason. He's moved up. He's a lottery guy. Um, But I, I do think right now they're, is more two way potential in the other guys. Uh, but jet, he, there's still a lot of season left and he has really shown some impressive offensive. That's why I chose this trio because I think they're both, con- they're, they're all like in that same mm-hmm. kind of small forward power forward shooting, slashing, hopefully two way yeah, kind of defense. Yeah, yeah. Kind of thing. So, uh, I, I wanted to make it hard and, and challenging, and I, I thought about maybe splitting up Asar and Max Lewis with four dollars each, and then it was. Uh, but ultimately, I, I like Asar a little bit better than Max Lewis right now. But Max Lewis is very intriguing. He's a guy I know you got to see up close. Um, I'm sure you'll see him up close again at some point during this season. All right, let's get into Asar Thompson's scouting, and I'm going to ask you where you would like to start this off. Cause I feel like there's a, a number of different ways we could, we can go with this one. Um, our default is always shooting. Um, shooting is going to be a difficult conversation when it comes to SAR, but maybe that's a good place to start. So yeah, let's F it. Let's just go it. All right. Go with it. Tell, yeah. You tell me how you <laughs> feel about his shooting. I want to uh, start wherever you want. Sure. So, Corey, I did want to start off by saying what I said to you before we started recording. Uh, Evaluating the Thompson twins has been really difficult for me. And I'm not trying to say all this or preface any of this by saying like, oh, like I think like I'm not trying to be different or some sort of outlier and go against the grain in terms of my evaluation of these twins. Like I said, I have Osar at number seven. I I do want to focus on the difficulty that comes with evaluating these two players. And for me, the, the issue is, and it's a point that you brought up in our group chat as well. And other people have brought up as well. It's really difficult to evaluate these guys considering where they're playing. Um, playing in the overtime elite, or sorry, for me as an evaluator, um, watching the overtime elite is an experience unlike anything I've seen in basketball. Like it's, or actually maybe not, maybe it is, it, it just considering that it's like a semi-pro pro league, right? And the type of the brand of basketball that I'm watching is really tough to watch at times. And the competition they're going up against is really rough to watch at times. So Overall, I just wanted to say that the evaluation of these twins is not as straightforward as I think some people may see it as, at least for me. It's been pretty difficult. But when when we get to the shooting, I just want to start off by saying I think his jumper still needs a lot of work. Um, I I think if you go back to last summer, last year, until now, I think the shooting has looked better, even like from the free throw line. Um, I I think the shooting looks better to me. It it looks like both twins are tinkering with their shot and things are starting to look a little bit better. But I would say Osar's jumper looks better than Amen's at this point in their development. And another thing, Corey, that I did want to say, it's weird that I'm doing this right now as we're talking because... I told myself I want to try to evaluate Asar without thinking about Amen, but because they're twins and because they play together, it's, it's very difficult. Hard. It's really, really hard. So I just want to say, Corey, and I'll let you go after this. I, I feel like Asar's jumper still needs a lot of work, 
Um, I, 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 the, some of the misses are still really gnarly. Um, but I would love to hear your, your feedback because I know that he needs a lot of work, but I also can acknowledge that a lot of work has already been put in and it does look better than it did last year. Yeah. Uh, I, I also, I think that it's important to evaluate them as two different players. Cause I don't think they're like, obviously there are similarities because they are measurables. Yeah. They're almost unrecognizable on the court. Like you have to like see their number or their shoes or whatever. But I do think there are a lot of differences in their, their games that might be subtle, but make all the difference. So I do think it's important to, to say that they are different players. As far as the shot, one of the reasons I was so interested in flying down to Atlanta and seeing the overtime product in person is because I wanted to see the Thompson's shooting development from last year in overtime's first year as a league to this year. And when I got there, you know, and you're just watching them shoot around as they prepare for the pro day, they're not going through drills or anything yet. It felt like watching a SAR shoot was yes, it was a little mechanical, but it was also mechanical in the right ways. It was, I am trying to work out the kinks in my jumper and I am, this is a practice time. This is for me to get it out. And it, there are moments where it's going to look smooth because all of those mechanical points are, are hit. And then there are going to be times where it just looks a little step one, step two, step three, and it misses and right. And it looks uh, not so great, but I think overall, especially when he got into the drills where he's, he's going into the mid post and he's spinning and he's fading and there's less time to just think about all the different things. It, there was a smoothness to it that I was like, Oh, that's very encouraging. You know, it, it's, it looks almost up top. There's, it looks very like traditional in a good way. I think sometimes where he loses it is, you know, his base, which is much, much improved. Again, this looks like a, a pretty traditional shooting base, but at, at times, uh, the top and the bottom could be a little bit disjointed on the timing of things. And that's kind of where it is. But when it's all on time, it's good. And, you know, I think he was over 40% at one point. I think he's at 33% from three now, but when I see him, shoot it off the catch. I think a lot of times I say, okay, that's, that's going to be a, a workable shot in the league. I think there's a lot of potential there. I think he's going to get that sorted out. He's going to be a guy. Yeah. He's not going to be Kyle Korver flying around screen, shooting 40% on high volume. And, but he's going to be a guy that you can't leave open. You can't really help off of. And who's going to be willing to shoot it. I think he's shown some flashes off the bounce where again, there's not really as much time to sit and think because if that happens, somebody's going to recover and put a hand in your face, right? So you want to get it off a little bit quicker. I'm pretty bullish on on him as a shooter in the long term, you know, even though it's not perfect. You know, the the free throw shooting, 64%. Yeah. Not not great, and I actually think his free throw shooting is a little bit less pretty at times than the mm-hmm. jumper is because when you're at the line by yourself, you have time to go through all those mechanical steps and it feels that way. But ultimately I think eventually he's going to be a guy who's probably in that 73 to 76% range from the free throw line, which is important because you know, we'll, which we'll discuss later. I think he's going to get there a fair amount, mm-hmm. but ultimately I think he's a guy who is going to be able to make that shot. Um, serviceable enough that he can use it as a weapon to do different things. Because if you don't guard it, I think he's going to, he's shown that he's going to be able to hit it. Yeah. Yeah. I also think Corey, it's been interesting to watch these overtime elite games and to see just the sheer space that both guys are being given. Um, mm. oh, sorry, and, uh, and I'm in. It's you know they're essentially being dared to take these shots. But I agree with you. I, I definitely agree with you. And uh, I, and I'm in de- more than a sorry. I think. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, I, I'm in. But, uh, giving, uh, I'm in is initiating a you know yeah not not I would say a fair amount more, but you know def- at least like walking the ball up the mm-hmm. court. So I, I think when he's there, I feel like he's getting left open and dared to shoot in a more like you're like Pronounced, almost yeah. like disrespectful yeah. way with a SAR. It's just like, Hey, he's not a great 
shooter mm -hmm. so you could sag off a little bit mm -hmm. so it's like uh amen they're giving a yard and i'm uh, sorry it's like a half yard yeah <laughs> kind of what it is right now but no i agree with you i, I think for me just w what i've seen so far with the sar is that they I, that the, but you know what's funny both of them more confidence this year and that's something we talked about with amen heading into the season where we were like yeah we're like dude this kid's just not even looking to put up shots and i was watching one of their games they were playing against uh holy something i i was it the rams or yeah see, yeah the holy rams right yeah and um there was one where you know amen was just literally wide open one of those disrespectful wide open ones and he threw up an air ball and i was like well okay that's kind of rough but at least he took it right yeah. and I, I think i saw the same way um and you know like i just feel like that's something that's encouraging even if they're not shooting it at 40 to 45 percent i think for asar especially there is a and Corey, I'm excited to hear you talk about this because you kind of hinted at it before. There is a directness to his game that I enjoy with Asar, where um, it, it feels like he, it, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but it feels like he knows how to make up his mind in terms of what he's going to do, and he's very direct about it. Now, I know sometimes like when people say that, they that can come off as like, oh, like, they have like tunnel vision or whatever. It's it's not that at all. I, I'm not trying to say that with Asar, but I just feel like there's a very direct nature to his game where he can make quick decisions or make you know decisions either for himself or for others. So when it comes back to the shooting, yeah, like I agree with you. Sometimes there is like a disconnect between the lower half and the upper half, but it looks better. Like overall, like something that you say all the time, right? Judge the form and not the percentage, right? And I yeah. think with Asar, overall the form looks better looks more compact looks a little bit more connected and overall if the if the confidence is there and the work is going to be there and you mentioned it yourself right the mechanical aspect where you can see that the, the the guy is trying to figure things out those are all good signs towards a player being on the right trajectory to become a better shooter so uh, obviously for me i still think there needs a lot of work. like he needs a lot of work on the jumper but it's clear that he's taking the right steps in the right direction yeah, because he's a much better shooter this year than he was last year. And even percentages be damned. And I know the three-point percentage is up, I think, probably like seven or eight percentage points. I think the free throw percentage is up like 10, 11 percentage points. Yeah. So, yeah, the percentages, while still not great, obviously there there is improvement. But like you said, like the form in and of itself is way better than last year. And I think, you know, some of the things that he's flashed, I, I, I like a lot of the mid-range stuff too, because I think that that mid-range, that mid-post is an area where he could really be like a three-level guy. And and I think that's important when I look at him as a player. He uh, there There's a path where he's a very, very complete, like small forward, power forward, two guard, this wingy hybrid who could score at all three levels. And he's made some really nice moves. Um, there's one possession where he, his handle actually got a little loose. I think he had isolated Bryce Warren and he just got to the right elbow and he kind of blew by him with his quick first step and, and got a jump on him and just stopped and popped over the elbow and like his, the elevation and it looked so smooth coming off his, his hand and it was just nothing but net right off the elbow. There's, you know, um, another play, uh, I believe against the cold hearts where he was in the mid post and he's still a little back down, turn over the left shoulder and off the backboard. Like there's, there's some nice mid post area stuff mm -hmm. for Asar, and because he's athletic. And I think what I like about it, and I know he's not, I think he's shooting 31% from the mid range. Shout out to drew Gooden's suit on Twitter who had a good thread about like some of the finishing stuff for the Thompson twins. Um, so like, that's not like an awesome percentage, but I like what I see and the volume so low that if he had just made, you know, two more or whatever, that percentage is probably much closer to where you want to see, but I, I like what I see out of it. So I, I like him as a potential three level guy because I, I think he's, he's going to be a guy who can get to that mid range spot face up and just, rise up and, and score and i think that could be a, a, a really interesting wrinkle to his game i don't know why but for some reason i didn't really even think that far and focus so much on like the three level aspect of his potential and i think that's like a really sobering reminder even for me to remember that these are 
kids. And I think even when I think back to what well, I, I don't want to keep mentioning Amen, but like I was real. I think we were pretty tough on Amen when we did our evaluation of him, right? And I think even then, when I think back to the things that I said or whatever, I, I, I do have to remember that these are kids that we're talking about. And so going back to everything that you said, Corey, in terms of their development and stuff, I agree with all that, man. And for him and for Asar, for, if he has that type of three level potential to go along with the playmaking stuff and him and, and the way that he attacks the rim. And, and I, it's, it's all really, really intriguing and why he is at seven on my board. And, 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 and I'm going to, I want to say, Corey, it was like pretty difficult for me to move him up that much, even on my board, but who's to say that that's the end of it. He may move up mm -hmm. even more on both of our boards by the end of the season. But um I like everything I saw in terms of the shooting. Not that I, I think it's perfect or whatever, but like you said, the development is good. And development in, in itself, even going up seven, eight percentage points is not an easy thing, you know? So the fact that there, the volume, obviously there's more volume and a higher percentage, those are good things. And let's hope that they just continue to go in that direction. Yeah, it's trending up, which is a good thing. There's a lot of season left to be played. Uh, I think that, you know, like you said, you have it, you have them at seven. I am at six. And with that said, I do think he should be in consideration at this point of the season for the third spot. I don't think anyone has run away with it. Uh, I think that any of the guys that you discuss in that, in that spot have a lot of question marks. You know, I, if you want to put Cam Whitmore there, well, he's shooting 24% from three. Um, and honestly, I think that some of the defensive stuff is, is not where it needs to be for him. I think Jarris Walker who we love and he's still a guy I have in that third spot, Jarris Walker Island, baby. Uh, I think that he's a guy that people are going to have questions about his offensive scoring potential at the next level. Cause he's not getting to show a lot of that, the initiation stuff and, and just some of the stuff that he showed in high school that he hasn't showed. Maybe it will it will, or won't it translate Nick Smith. I mean, we barely got to see him. Yeah. Keontae George, he's struggled with his outside shot a little bit. Mm hmm. Uh, Brandon Miller, he's struggling to finish inside the paint. So, and, and Amen, you know, who is the guy who everyone is projecting to go number three, he's got some real finishing issues. He's got some real shooting issues. So, you know, I, I think Asar is firmly in that discussion. If, you know, we're going to sit and, and break down in every prospect's game, I think it's hard to leave him out. Now, you mentioned some of the playmaking stuff. And it's interesting. Because everyone talks about Amen as, you know, this kind of high level playmaker. And I think he's averaging like a half assist more than Asar is, which is interesting because, you know, I was nervous with Asar when they got picked to be on the same team this year that Asar was going to be strictly playing off the ball and they're going to let Amen run everything. Mm. And Asar is getting a lot of ball handling duties himself and i'm really into it yeah mm. i think that i i know amen is is the guy who everyone says makes the you know is the playmaker because he makes a lot of these flashy yeah. plays but i gotta tell you i think asar plays with a pace mm -hmm. while amen is so explosive in getting to spots and and getting paint touches and and forcing rotations mm. asar just plays with this smoothness and this pace that i just really 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 enjoy and he does a great job hitting the roller and the lob man um i think he's a guy who makes the extra pass he i think can pass with either hand he's he can also do some of the mid-air stuff i think i mean I, I don't think he's that far off from amen it might not be as flashy but i think functionally i don't know i, I like it a lot and when we talk about that mid-range area i think he's a guy who's going to put pressure out of pick and rolls he can make all of he can make the pass to the lob man he can hit the corners and he's also a guy that's going to be able to get to that little mid-range shot or a floater which i think he's got decent touch on so i i think that the pick and roll as a pick and roll playmaker especially out of like second side actions i think he could be a real valuable weapon in mm -hmm. those scenarios i love everything that you said um the first thing that I wanted to bring up was something that I've enjoyed that the city reapers have done so far is that 
Um, I also had the same concerns that you did, Corey, in terms of the ball handling duties and responsibility and stuff. I think something that they're doing really well with the City Reapers is staggering their minutes. Um, obviously, they start the games together, but then they'll stagger their minutes where there will be times where they're not on the floor together and either one of them are the main initiators. And then they're, they both get an opportunity to kind of show what they can do on the floor without the other twin. Right. So I think that's been smart by the City Reapers. With that said, Corey, I do want to agree with you. It feels like the two of them do kind of play a different brand of basketball. When Amen Thompson is in the game, it feels like a track meet. It just feels like I, I remember one of the I think they were playing um what was it? Hoop Nation. They were playing Hoop Nation. And there was mm-hmm. like a, a time where Amen was you know, huge in the game by himself without Asar. And it just felt like one Asar possession. missed those games, I believe. Well, he was he, okay. Maybe he wasn't in that game at all. Okay, I but, don't know. I maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I uh, thought he, he might have injured himself. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Something like that. But it, just watching like three or four possessions in a row, it was just like rebound, run out, yeah. turnover, run out the other way, air ball, rebound. Right? You you get what I'm saying? Like it yeah, hundred like, percent. I think just, it's one of the chaos. that's one of the hardest parts about breaking these guys down. Yeah, is and one of the reasons I. Uh, I feel like they should have been split up from, I mean, I mean, for the league sure. perspective, it's great that they're playing yeah. together. Um, you know, for a, a Amazon prime subscription perspective, it's great that they're playing together, but from a developmental evaluation standpoint, it feels like they're playing JV teams sometimes mm-hmm. as varsity mm-hmm. guys. And they're just like bigger, faster, stronger. And they have a lot of the athletes and it does get a lot of, Hey, hit ahead, dunk, play the passing lanes. Like you said, it's a track meet, and it, it sometimes it makes it hard. Which, when we get to more of the finishing discussion, uh, uh-huh. you know, I, I there are some points to be made. Corey, with the with the track meet type of vibe, there was something that I noticed that I want to ask you. Um, I feel like, and this might just be me, right? From what I've seen. I could be wrong. You could feel different. People can feel differently. Wondering, how do you feel about the two of them and their handle? Because for me, I thought Asar's handle was a little bit more uh, reserved, if that makes sense. Like, I feel like with Amen, he gets the ball poked out of his hands a lot or he loses it because he's so kind of frenetic with his pace and maybe it doesn't even have to do with his handle but maybe it's just like the way that he plays but i felt like with amen like i'm not saying he has a bad handle but i feel like he doesn't protect the ball as well as osar did or maybe i'm just getting the two confused but that's how i felt just like my my instant reaction from the two maybe i get some of your feedback on how you felt i think osar's handle maybe a little looser as far like I think sometimes he kind of like uh and I, I think his handle's good. Mm-hmm. I'll start there. But I think it's a little bit looser in that sometimes like it's not the defense that does anything to him, but he'll just like fumble it or something. And you know, that this is something I've noticed sometimes in games. It's uh it happened a couple of times in drills at the pro day. Mm. But then with Amen, I feel like what ha- I feel like Asar's got a little bit more like left to right wiggle mm. and amen is much more like uh, kind of straight liney and even mm. when he changes directions it's not like he's creating like he, he a ton of space it's just his ter- his stops and starts are so quick mm. i feel like a sar plays a little bit more up and down too like he'll change height he'll get low he'll get high and amen is almost like a race car at all times and yeah. he's just always low to the ground and because some i don't think he gets like you know he you're not going to see like that iverson kind of cross out of him right it's very compact and tight to his body so maybe that's where you know defenders are able to get their hands on the ball a little bit i, I think that's kind of where the, the the difference lies for me um as, as ball handlers and i saw them I don't know, like two, three weeks ago, something like that in Brooklyn. And what I was really interested in watching is they were playing in a high school gym. The OT facility, there's more space, there's more room. And I was like, all right, let's see what this half court offense looks like for these guys when there's like 10 feet less of space on the floor. 
instead of playing 94 feet, you're going to play 84 feet. Mm -hmm. Everything's going to be a little bit more cramped, a little more compact. And uh, I think that the half court stuff was a little bit more difficult for both as it would be because these are gigantic people on a smaller court. So it's, mm -hmm. it would be like that for most of these athletes. Um, but Amen wasn't able to get to his spots quite as easy because it's easier to make rotations because the court is smaller. Mm -hmm. Um, Asar, a, a, a little bit of the same thing, but he was more attacking from the side. So there was a little bit more room for him to kind of catch and rip and go and get to the hoop. But it was interesting. Now they're not going to be playing on that court, so yeah. it's. But it was just from a, a skill perspective. It's almost like let's see what stands out a little bit, and then you know they they got it was a tight game, and they got up and down, and you know you go on Twitter yeah. and you see these like dunk contest highlights. But a, a lot of the game wasn't like that when it wasn't that track meet. It was a little bit harder. But I feel like a SARS game is a little bit more suited for that half court mm. kind of offense. Mm. Okay. No, that's fair. That's fair. And Corey, like, uh, some, I don't remember who it was, but I think I saw something on Twitter where somebody was saying, like, we shouldn't overreact when Kaysen Wallace has a great game against uh, whoever the fuck state, right? right? Or we shouldn't freak out if Maxwell Lewis has a good game against Hawaii, blah, blah, blah. But, like, my only issue is, like, I feel like those same people freak out when you know, the Thompson twins have a great game against uh, the Bruins, which I don't even know where they're from or what that organization I is. I think it's oh, it's, it's a school. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just like it, it that I think that's difficult too. like, how do we not no doubt. hold that same standard? You know, like if we're going to be like, Hey, screw Hawaii. What, what if Hawaii played Hill, the Hillcrest Bruins? I'm sure Hawaii <laughs> will win by 40. Maybe, you know, like I, my, I'll tell you my favorite. Okay. Brandon Miller gets a lot of shit because mm -hmm. he's older for a freshman. He's like a month older than the Thompson twins. There it is. That that's. Hmm. I think he's 20.5 months. Mm -hmm. So, and the Thompson's are 20.4, you know, mm -hmm. maybe that's two months out of you know, whatever it is. Like yeah. the age is very close. I, I agree that it's very difficult, man. And, yeah. and look, there's a lot of talent in this overtime program. Sure. Okay, uh, going and seeing them at the pro day, seeing how they train, seeing these guys. There's going to be a lot of guys in the next couple of classes that are going to be like potential top 10, potential top five guys wow. that are coming out uh, of this overtime program. So it's not that they're not playing talent, mm -hmm. but they're not playing talent that is at the same levels as some of these higher levels. The guys, right. scoots, scoots playing professionals. Uh, you know, these other guys are going to be playing in the ACC and the SEC and these high level leagues, the OTE, it's not that they have the talent and I think they, they're getting good coaching, but you know, some of these guys are 16 years old, right? So even though they look physically developed and they're really talented, they are nowhere near where they're going to be two years from now, which I think is a scary thing to think about. Because for them, it's amazing. They're getting to play against some older guys. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but as it stands now, the Thompsons are playing much younger guys. And that's where you see a lot of this track meet stuff and how it gets so sloppy because it's not as structured. They're playing high school guys. Yeah. Now, they're dominating these guys in a lot of ways and their team's winning. So those are good things. So sure. it's it, it does. But it makes it difficult because... You know, how many players through the course of, you know, the draft have been in this kind of similar situation where, you know, it's like, all right, great. They're, they're Rob Dillingham is who's going to be, you know, uh, the top Kentucky recruit mm -hmm. is, is on the team and they're taking it personal and they're making his, his life hell, but also he's they're They're much older there. He's in high school. You know, it's not like they're doing that to somebody in their class. So it's hard. But that's what makes this evaluation really fun and challenging. And it, what it's what makes them have a lot of potential, but maybe a little bit more downside than people are willing to admit as well. Exactly that. Exactly that. And, and so, like, once again, Corey, I, I do think you make a great point in that they are dominating against these kids and in this league and all that stuff. But I just I just sometimes wish that people would kind of hold that same standard is all. Like, they, I, I was one of the games. It's just... 
the some of the turnovers are unbelievable and the type of stuff that like i wouldn't even see in like my church league um and then you know they're like dribbling well, off themselves maybe and, maybe we don't go that far may, you're <laughs> probably right <laughs> 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 You're probably right. But um it, it's it's been wild and I just feel like hey, let's keep the same standard for everybody. I think would be cool and um just acknowledging that everywhere that these kids play or not even just OTE college or whatever, like there's talent everywhere and competition everywhere, but you know, sometimes the competition isn't so great and it's not a bad thing for us to emphasize that as well. And as long as they're playing great, that's good too, but yeah, I just wanted to bring that. Up. I think that's been kind of difficult for me because when I get like six straight minutes of game action where they're literally just running up and down the court, that's tough, man. It's just yeah. I don't even know what I'm watching. So I know it. And I think that's a good segue into like Asar's at rim finishing numbers. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because, you know, when you look at two point percentage and all of that, like their their finishing numbers are inflated because they're getting so many runouts and as good as I think they're going to be in transition because, um, and, and again, we're talking about Asar as good as I think he's going to be because he could pass, he could finish. Yeah. He's athletic, you know, uh, on any court, he's going to be one of the most athletic guys. As soon as he steps into the NBA, he is going to be a guy who thrives mm -hmm. in transition. Right. And that's going to be really fun. But those finishing numbers are a little bit inflated. But again, shout out to Drew Gooden's suit who who went in and watched all of the OTE games available and hand tracked their finishing numbers in non transition attempts. Okay. And Asar is at fifty eight percent, which um is decent. It's not bad. It's not. Yeah. You know, uh, Good, you'd probably great. you'd probably hope he was more like sixty five because yeah. again we're talking about the competition level, but fifty eight percent it's decent. Amen's at fifty percent. So to put that in perspective, um, and Drew Gooden's suit on Twitter, he had like a an Excel sheet like with a, a bunch of lottery guys, and fifty percent would put you in the Cam Reddish territory. So that's where Amen is finishing, and I know a lot of people think that the, you know the He's got this great touch. That's something I'm worried about. Asar, I think, has a little bit softer touch. So it for me, it matches the eye test. That 58% puts you in Anthony Edwards territory and um and Brandon Ingram territory. Now again, Anthony Edwards and Brandon Ingram, they're doing it in different leagues. Yeah. And you're also looking at samples that are not completely big enough to make full on judgments and evaluations on but enough that it matches the eye test i kind of like asar's touch i think he can go high off the glass uh i think that he could finish with both hands and again it's just that pacing i think when he goes to the rim he can have these really aggressive rim attacks where it's just like you have to foul him you, you know, he's just too quick, but then also he has these like long, smooth Euro steps that he can go in and out, like almost like uh, Cam Whitmore. One of the things we talked about with him, like, I love how he can like slither in between guys. There's this smoothness and this pace also with Asar that I love. So 58% I, I want to see come up in, in this league, but also I think there are reasons to be encouraged because a lot of the times too, like he's got a really quick second jump. So when he misses, he's able to go get the offensive rebound and, you know, put it back up, draw a foul or miss or make. But I, I do like what I've seen. And I think again, in, in a NBA where he, he will have more space, probably not as much defensive attention. You're probably, it's probably going to be harder to have so much help crashing into the paint because there's going to be more shooters on a floor. I, I think his numbers, um, are going to translate to the league. I agree. I agree. I actually really like him attacking the ring, and which is like, well, I don't know. I'm sure everyone's gonna be like, yeah, good, good point there, bud. Um, but <laughs> that I, is what you come to the draft hack for. <laughs> I like Asar Thompson attacking the rim. <laughs> I've enjoyed it though. I, I'm I'm with you, Corey. I think um how should I put this nicely? I think he's less contact averse than his brother is. 
Um, I, I think Amen really, really fades away from contact and is avoiding it. Um, I would say Asar is better at taking contact, but although at the same time, he's not like prime Jimmy Butler or anything like that either. No. Um, yeah, but I, I think he, he he's he's better at taking contact and finishing through it and picking up fouls and all that stuff than Amen is. Um, and at the same time, I, I do want to say, Corey, like after rewatching all this stuff, I don't hate Amen as much as I, I, I thought I would um, or as I did preseason. Uh, he grew on me as well. Some of the Euro stuff that you're talking about that Asar does, Amen does as well. And it, it, they both make it look really elegant and beautiful. And, and, and Corey, it, and I also think that speaks to the larger point. Like I can understand why people... Uh, fell in love with Amen and Asar, like both of them. Like there is an elegance to the way that they move, which is pretty awesome and pretty incredible to watch. It is pretty jarring and amazing. Like I, I wouldn't go so far as saying uh, as to say that they're generational athletes, uh, as some people have put it. But no, they're they're very athletic and they do make it look pretty damn beautiful. Um, but I do want to kind of just you know piggyback off of what you said and say that Asar does seem to be. Um, a stronger finisher at the rim and it looks like the numbers back that up um, but i also do just like overall the fact that he seems to not be as afraid or as averse to contact as amen is and so that was just one of the different points that i wanted to bring up yeah which is interesting because amen is also he's actually shooting really well at the free throw line this year but i i agree there are times i also think he's not as comfortable with his left hand as mm -hmm. Asar is. So when he yeah. gets downhill to that side, he kind of fades and tries to do like this yeah. awkward right hand mm -hmm. thing. And that's part of it. When I was at the pro day, Asar had this Euro step through traffic that I saw from like five feet away. And I was like, stunning. Yeah. I was like, wow. I was like, wow. And uh, what it reminded me of a little bit, there was this one play with Anthony Edwards versus Kentucky when he was in college that he did this like Euro step and then like up and under finish. And it was kind of in like semi transition. It was like, he hit like the defender with an in and out at the three point line. And then he got downhill and hit a little Euro and up. And, and I was like, that is an all-star caliber move. Mm. And when I saw that with a star, I was like, wow, that is like, an all-star caliber move. Now, it's very hard to be an all-star in the NBA. I'm not saying one move is a good indicator of uh, future success, but it's one of those things that I see and I make a note of, and I'm like, wow, that is like that movement is is something that is a special movement pattern that special NBA players also possess. And I see that with Asar. And another thing that I like with Asar, I think he's a good cutter. Mm-hmm. And I think he's got really good footwork in the post. Now, I, I'm not saying that you should give him the ball on the low block and let him like go to work, although I think he can do that with mismatches. But I really like when he kind of like 45 cuts, gets the ball down low, and then kind of uses like a drop step mm -hmm. to go up and like finish or dunk. I think he's got that in his game where it's 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 like a quick hit action, maybe out of a set where you're you're kind of getting guys off movement and out of position and on switches and he could kind of turn over his shoulder and just make these quick moves and go up and i think he's got that in his bag as well that's kind of the last thing i want to touch offensively but i, I think the the overall point with that i want to make with the sars offensive game before we move on is i just really think that the kid has a, a bunch of different ways that he can impact the game both with the ball and without it offensively mm -hmm. And I think mm. some of the ways in which he's going to down the line impact the game without the ball, we haven't even seen on a consistent basis. We're just seeing the flashes of. But regardless of competition, regardless of you know playing on this stack team, whatever, he's made some offensive improvements that really uh, are, are encouraging if you're trying to buy in to a Sar Thompson as an offensive player. Yeah, man. No, I, I agree with everything that you said. I think w one last thing that I did want to say is like, I feel the second jump stuff is awesome too. You yeah. mentioned that. Yeah. It's really, really good. Um, but just overall, Corey, I, I think I'm, I'm there with you, man. 
I'm there with you. I think overall, like it just, I, I said this to you before recording too. It just, it was really difficult for me to evaluate him and both of the, just the league in general. But I, I also want to say like, I'm not hating on any of this. Like, Corey, you've made a lot of great points from being there and seeing stuff up close, but what they're doing at the overtime elite is really innovative and new and different. And I think they deserve a lot of credit for trying something that's different and creating another avenue for these kids to eventually make it to the league right so i do want to give them credit for that it's just i think in the same way that these players are on a developmental track i think the ote is also on a developmental track right and they're growing and learning and i'm sure they're making changes and adjustments on the fly as well but overall i just think like it, it was a difficult evaluation for me but for sure they're definitely is something there with Asar. And, and Corey, I also wanted to bring up a hypothesis to you. Mm. Maybe it's completely off base or whatever, but you mentioned like the off ball stuff, which I agree. I think he's a really good cutter and a guy who does who shows that he can be a guy who can both play with the ball in his hands and off ball. Was wondering, just a hypothesis, do you think that he's so good off ball because his brother has always been kind of, you know, the marquee, number one creator and he's like learned to play off of his brother do you think that's why he's so good at that i do and as a matter of fact i he said that okay you know uh, i when we went to atlanta we got to interview them and uh, i want to say steven uh shout out steven asked him about that and you know at some point you know they were like at some point you know they kind of were like all right i'm in like you have the ball in your hands and honestly, I think it's a good thing. I think it's beneficial for him because he learned how to play this role where he might not have the ball in your hands. And we say it all the time. Like, look, there are a lot of very, very good players in the NBA. And if you look at, you know, Tankathon right now, right? Like you're going to see a bunch of these teams who already have number one guys. Detroit, you got Cade and Jaden Ivey, you know, Charlotte, LaMelo, um Houston you have Jalen Green and Kevin Porter Jr and uh you know maybe San Antonio doesn't quite have that right now Orlando you have Paulo and Franz so you know who know like there you're you're going to have to learn how to play without the ball and for honestly for Amen it's probably a good thing that he is kind of splitting a little bit of the duties with Asar because maybe he's learning a little bit more so than he would have last year when they were on separate teams. So, you know, I, but it's important, man, because you're not going to have this usage where you have the ball in your hands all the time. And there's this heliocentric offense based around Asar Thompson. You know, he doesn't have that shooting gravity. Um, he's not going to be Luca putting up 60, 20 and, and 10, right? <laughs> like, too soon. Too soon. Too, sorry. It was in overtime though. So, you know, yeah. inflated stats. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's beneficial for him. And, you know, I, I think that we're also seeing that when he does have the ball in his hands, he, he does have that creation ability. You know, he is, he isn't scared to experiment with his shooting. And when I asked him, uh, you know, what the most underrated parts of his games were, he was like, it's, you know, I think it's my playmaking and my shooting. And I think that, that's bearing out a little bit. Obviously the shooting is not a hundred percent there. It needs no. work continuously, which he is continuously working on it, but the playmaking has been there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The playmaking no. has, and the shooting's improved. So I definitely think that getting used to playing off of his brother has allowed him to be a guy who can play on or off the ball. Okay. So I was right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were. Yes, mm -hmm. you were. Yeah. I think that's a good hypothesis. Um, all right. I, we went I in know. depth on that offense, man. I hope okay. everybody out there is, is enjoying the last episode of the, uh, 2022 year for the draft act. We are going to take a quick break and talk about his defense a little bit and, uh, finish out the show. All right. We are back to talk about his defense, get into some comps and uh, sell you this pen on Asar Thompson. So uh, let's get into his defense and let's start on the ball. How do you feel about Asar Thompson as an on-ball defender? Um, I think on-ball or off-ball, um, I see him as a very young defender. 
if that makes sense. Um, the talent is there for sure. Like I really actually enjoyed both of them. Let me focus on Asar. I really enjoyed yeah. Asar on the ball. Um, I think he moves incredibly well. Uh, I think he's really, really long. Um, I think there were some blocks that I saw that I was really, really impressed with. Um, but so uh, we're not doing off ball, right? So, okay, on ball, um, a lot to like. I think there's a firm foundation for him to become a really, really good defender. Um, but young, still super young. You know, I think he falls for the head fakes and the shot fakes a lot. Yes, I does. think um, I'd like to see some improvement there. Uh, but overall, like I, I want to be positive about him as a defender but i won't say that he's like perfect or he's gonna walk into the league and become an impact defender from day one i just want to say like with more time and more exposure to higher level of competition in the beginning it, i think it will be rough i think he will get baited into some fouls and into some bad decisions but overall like you can see the potential where he could become oh, maybe an all-world type of defender with more time and seasoning and stuff like that because the raw tool and tools and talent and even instincts i would say are there it's just he's got to kind of rein that in a little bit and go to finishing school and become a more mature defender is how i feel yeah i think that's fair i, I think part of the reason he probably feels like you can bite on pump fakes try to go for blocks in those scenarios like most of these games aren't that close and it's like and get the block turn defense into offense but i do think that he has shown some flashes of on-ball defense where you're just like oh my like this dude can lock down he's not like crazy long you know 610 wingspan or whatever but he's got a solid build they got good in he has good instincts and i, I think when he's engaged he's a problem i yeah. you know and some of the time, like uh, he's a guy that you see actually block shots like mm -hmm. on the perimeter, you know, that's really hard to do. That's like Dwayne Wade did it a lot. Um, you know, Anthony Edwards was a guy who was able to do it. So what he has this anticipation on shot contests. Uh, I think he's got good, like on the ball outside of like maybe biting on pumps or whatever. I do think he has like good defensive instincts mm. i do i think like just fundamentally i think he he gets down in a stance um he could flip his hips like i think he's got all of that potential and i i think he's really impactful on that end you know he obviously gets a lot of like stock numbers mm -hmm. and you know again you know competition play style all of that stuff but he's a guy that i foresee turning defense into offense in the nba mm. as a guy who is going to be able to you know pick a pocket and get out and transition. He's a guy who I think is going to get a block either on the ball or coming over on the help side uh, and, and turn defense into offense uh, off the ball. He's going to be able to play passing lanes. I don't, obviously a lot of the city reapers are kind of in a gamble. You know, they put pressure and try to force and they want to turn it into that track meet, but I don't think he's always gambling. Yes. I do think he's, he has a understanding of when and when not to gamble. Now, part of that could be he's older and the speed of the game feels slow for them. So he mm. doesn't, you know, if he's over gambling, he can recover and blah, blah, blah. But I, I do think he, he knows when and when not to gamble a little bit more than some of the other guys on the team. And then, you know, because they have that team has overwhelming athleticism. Mm -hmm. all around on all around on the board so i think they know when they do gamble they have help waiting for them but mm -hmm. things that i've seen in person you know when they did a 4v4v4 four 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 at the pro day he was guarding you know the length of the court on the ball which was really impressive uh when i saw him in brooklyn playing uh his his on ball defense was super super impressive and he competes and he's talking trash and you know the that athleticism really pops in, in person. So I'm, I'm pretty high on his two way potential. And, you know, I honestly, I, I have him higher than I do on men, even though I, like you have come up on our men a little bit, having seen them both in person and, and thinking about them in different contexts. But I just, I, I think he's a little bit more impactful and I, I just, I, I think he's a, like, a, he's like a very traditional, like small forward prospect yeah. that plays both sides of the floor well and i like that no Corey. what i want what i wrote in my notes that i really wanted to emphasize when talking about his defense is i really enjoyed the effort 
um, which mm. I wasn't expecting. Like I, I, I don't know. Maybe I had some like weird predisposed notions of, about them, but he, I, I thought he really competed. And off ball, Corey, you know, like whenever we go through high school stuff and whatever, we're always like, yeah, off ball. These kids, they lose focus, whatever. I actually thought he was like pretty focused. Yeah. And there was a lot of like not not too much of like just man watching or ball watching, but I, I feel like his eyes were moving and he's trying to you know I didn't think he lost his man as much as I thought he would. Um, the the gambling stuff that you mentioned I thought was excellent. Where yeah, like obviously these guys are looking to play the passing lanes. They're they're le- looking to do the reach around stuff, you know. Sometimes, but I, I thought overall like he did a good job of being locked in even when he was on the weak side of the court like just knowing where his man was knowing where the ball was and being ready to read and react to whatever was going on and i was like oh i i I was not expecting to like this as much as i am right now and i think a lot of that is focus and concentration and effort and so yeah the, the biggest thing that i wrote down with his defense was the effort is there you know some of the some of the weak side blocks that he he had. I was like, this is excellent stuff. Mm. You know, and even like closing out. Yeah, sometimes the closeouts weren't the prettiest, but the effort was there for him for him to get there and to make it difficult. And of course, he fell for some head fakes and went flying into the crowd. But overall, <laughs> I just I just liked that he was there. You know, and that he was reading, that he was making that effort to get out there and to make sure that the shot wasn't going to be an easy one. So I, I think overall, I'm with you, man. As a defender, I really enjoyed a lot of it. I think one of my big critiques for Amen was that I thought off ball, he got lost a lot and he was like really getting bullied on some stuff. And I didn't feel that way watching Asar. So um, I'm really high on him as a defender. It's just like I said, on ball, I think, you know, there's some maturing to be found, but I, I don't that's going to happen. That's going to be there. Yeah. And there are, I, I think yeah. the worst thing I could say is sometimes he's straight up. Like he's, he's not in sure. his, he's not always like right in his stance, depending, mm-hmm. you know, and that's like youth stuff. But right. I do think his principles have improved night and day from last year mm-hmm. to, to this year. You know, he, if he's supposed to be the low man, he's, he's the low man versus last year. Maybe he was a little bit more in deny on his man on the weak side of the court when it's like, all right, now, you, well, now, now, there's a right. wide open lane at the rim, right. right? So there, I, I think that's that's good. That's improvement, and that's what we what we want to see. Because if that if they were going to be older than everybody playing young guys, and that stuff didn't improve, that would be that would be bad. But yeah. they're improvements, so I think that's how you grade them, even discounting you know the fact that they're more talented than everybody else. I, I mean, in, I think obviously college it's hard to picture them in this college scenario. And one of the things that I, I did say last year about the OT that I liked when evaluating some of the the draft eligible guys is that I did like kind of the flow, even though it's sloppy and ugly. A lot of the times I did like that you can experiment and grow your game and play in this wide open, sometimes unstructured and you can learn things that maybe you wouldn't get the chance to learn in a much, much more structured environment in college. I obviously I think Asar would be a a very good college player, but you know, he would see a lot of different things. He'd see more weird zones and blah, blah, blah. And that maybe he wouldn't even necessarily see in the NBA level. So, you know, I think in those games, it's like hard to evaluate prospects just Mm -hmm. as much so as it might be to evaluate them in this OTE setting. So I, you know, pros and cons, but I, it's all the stuff like he, when he wants to be, he can dominate the game defensively. Right. And, And that's what you want to see with him going forward i a million percent agree i just once again i was i was pleasantly surprised i just i really thought i was going to hate him off ball i I thought he was going to be gambling all the time and just losing his man and whatever and it wasn't there at all and i don't know why i was expecting that but i was really happy that that's not what i saw on film so credit to him for that all right if you were buying stock in asar thompson who may you have bought stock in previously this this was really hard for me i i usually have somebody and i'm usually really excited about some 90s guy but i'm gonna give you my comp and it's not a pretty one and it's not perfect but if all goes well and the three level scoring is there and the defense continues to be what it is and he's gonna play make and stuff then why not jalen brown um oh. was a guy that i thought of um jalen brown didn't have the tightest handle coming in nor does he have the tightest handle now but a guy who has really learned to shoot a guy who impacts the 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 game on both ends of the floor and is a really good scorer he's averaging what like 27 28 points a game. i don't even know it's very good 
he's very good at basketball. And I think if we're going to talk about Asar being a top five, top seven type of guy, and he continues to improve in the areas that we're talking about and has the gift and skills and athleticism that he has, why not bring up a guy like Jalen Brown was kind of what I was challenging myself on too. And obviously not a direct comp, not trying to say it's a direct comp, I think. Um, but he could be that level of player is what I started to think. So I said, Jalen Brown. I really like that comp a lot. Um, and I can certainly see that. I think there's a pathway and because, you know, you, Jalen Brown was nowhere near mm -hmm. the kind of offensive player in right. college. He was much sloppier, uh, and he worked his butt off mm -hmm. to, you know, get to the point where he's at. And still, you, you know, a lot of times you see, um, some you know, Celtics fans talking about like his dribbling being yeah. loose and sloppy, but, uh, it, and his, his jumper is so much cleaner than it was in college. I, I think that's a really, really fun comp for him. And I honestly, I think it's a great role for him where it's like, yes. all right, Asar is not a number one guy necessarily. And I think Jalen Brown could be on a lot of teams, but you see how much value he brings being the number two guy as the co-star to Jason Tatum. And there are times where he steps up and he's the, he's got it going and he's going to be the number one guy and Jason Tatum takes a step back and they could swing back and forth. But ultimately like he knows like, all right, I'm the number two guy. I'm going to get my shots, but I'm the compliment. I'm, you know, not necessarily the Robin, but you know, maybe a night wing. So yeah, yeah. I, I like that comp. Mine was like kind of Andrew Wiggins. Uh, oh which I, I honestly, I don't think is super far off from Jalen Brown. I mean, obviously Jalen has got a little bit more offensive responsibility, but Andrew Wiggins is a guy who has fit into this golden state system was at times the second most important guy on the floor for them on their championship run, uh, defends multiple positions, shoots open jump shots, attacks the rim, gets out in transition cuts to the hoop, makes smart passes. Um, the player that he's turned into in golden state. And then to get our kind of, you know, old school comp. And I think stylistically a little bit different, but maybe like versatility wise, kind of a uh, Sean Marion ish. Ooh, good. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think he's yeah. got, I, I mean, Sean Marion had years where he was 20 points per game, 22 yes. points per game. Right. So there are definitely some scoring seasons, even though you don't traditionally think of Sean Marion as this like guy who was scoring a lot, but he, he got boards. He could pass a little bit. He spaced the floor, even though it looked weird. It, it was effective enough. He got out in transition and played fast with those Suns teams. Uh, and he defended whoever. So I, it, it it won't l visually look the yeah. same because Sean Marion was such an uh, unique and awkward looking player, mm -hmm. but I think mm -hmm. effectiveness wise, that could also be another kind of role for him. I, I love that comp. Sean Marion, fantasy basketball, absolute legend. He was going number one or number two in every draft for like six years in a row because of exactly what you talked about, Corey. He had surprising uh, scoring punch, averaging, you know, 18, 20 points per game, but was grabbing you rebounds, was getting steals, was blocking shots, was doing everything, you know, even getting some assists here and there. So I think that's a great comp it's an incredible comp but i think overall Corey, what you said about like the the sidekick thing is awesome dude i, I think of him as he could be dwight true he could be assistant to the regional manager you know and I, an unbelievable number two who's incredibly competent in so many i mean look at what dwight is a black belt in karate he he runs a beet farm he owns his own home and land he's incredibly competent but also uh, isn't exactly the one that you want driving, you know, things all the time. And eventually he grew into it. And oh, Corey, you're actually you're actually muted. Can't hear you. But, Sometimes uh, he carried the episodes, though. Exactly. Exactly. Which is what which is what Asar may end up becoming and what Jalen Brown is currently doing for the Celtics. Right. Maybe there's a night where Jason Tatum, although Jason Tatum seems to never have off nights anymore. But if there is a <laughs> night when Jason Tatum has an off night, Jalen Brown can carry the show. So I'm 100 percent with you with that comp. Yeah, I think those are are very good um, and lofty guys for Asar to aspire to, to be. But I, I really think there are outcomes where he, he hits them. I really do. I think Asar is a, a guy who I'm, I'm surprised that I, you know, I, I like it 
as much as I do. And, um, you know, I, I, again, I said it earlier, I think he's potentially a guy that's, you know, we have to consider to be the third man off the board. And I, am I predicting that it's going to be him? I would, I would bet no, but I, I think he's worthy of consideration. All right, Albert, it is that time for the last time in 2022. It's time for you to sell me this pen on Asar Thompson. Here we go. Uh, Asar Thompson is a really interesting player and a guy that we just spent over an hour breaking down on this pod, Uh, whether it's on the offensive side of the ball or the defensive side of the ball. The reason why you're going to want to be interested in Asar Thompson is because he's a guy who can potentially be a number one or a number two option for your basketball team. He's going to be a guy, as we mentioned earlier, a guy that you're going to feel comfortable putting next to a star level player. He's done it all his life. He's played next to Amen Thompson, his twin brother. He's also a guy that you're going to feel very comfortable giving the reins to when you need him to be a number one option. He's showing right now in the OTE that he's a guy that can lead and direct and orchestrate an offense. He runs pick and roll really, really well. He's a developing shooter. He's a guy who, as Corey mentioned, is becoming a three-level type of scorer and may eventually become a rock-solid three-level type of scorer in the NBA. You then couple that or pair that with what he's doing on the defensive side of the ball, what he can do on the ball with his versatility and length and athleticism, what he can do off the ball with the way that he reads the floor and he's seeing how different teams are progressing and doing things on the floor. You couple all that together, and we're talking about an extremely high-level player who has the ceiling to become a guy who you put next to your star player and you feel very comfortable about potentially having a championship-level type of team is what Osar Thompson's ceiling might be. And if you're interested in that, you should probably take him in the top 10. Absolutely. Well said. Great sign-off to the year 2022. All right, Albert. Um, where can the people find your work and uh talk about your you know your last piece yeah um you guys can find my work at no ceilings nba uh is where you can find me um i recently dropped a piece on jalen clark who for you know and you know if you're a draft casual or someone who you know doesn't really get into the draft until the end of the season or whatever you may not be very familiar with who that is but jalen clark is a really interesting wing player for the ucla bruins who is local to me and a guy who I've seen play live a couple of times now, um, a handful of times now, and who I believe may be the best or one of the best perimeter defenders in all the country. And he has turned that defense into a lot of offense, kind of like Asar and Amen Thompson, in that he gets a lot of steals and deflections and runouts, and he's scoring a ton in transition and doing a great job of that. So I wrote about him last week, compared him to the legendary safety, Ed Reed of the Baltimore Ravens. And... Um, yeah, that's where you can find me. And I also on Twitter, I'm at Alberto Gim is where I'm at. And obviously here as the uh, second, the other half of the Draft Act NBA podcast is where you can find me. Uh, I just saw Jalen with Nathan uh, at the Garden uh, when they played Kentucky. And yeah, that kid can hoop. He can. Pops off the screen. Modern day Javante Green for, uh, you know, NBA purposes. But I, I love that comp. Um the, the deep dives podcast to go along with it was fantastic with you and Nick. So make sure you check out Albert's piece. And then after you listen to this, if you haven't already check out the deep dive show, which um, Albert and, and Nick talked about Jalen Clark and broke, broke him, his game down. Um, you can find me at Corey Tulliba on Twitter. Uh, last week I wrote about Derek Whitehead and um, you know, how, he can recover his draft stock. Are we overreacting to it? And uh, I finished it off with my first little, what I'm calling food court, where every time I go to scout a game, I'm going to go to a local eatery and, uh, you know, give you a little, little, little slice of where you might be able to eat if you go and attend a game in that area. So I uh, hit up lions and tigers and squares, uh, in New York City after the game at the Garden and got some Detroit-style pizza, which was just phenomenal. Really, truly was. So I'm going to uh, Jersey. If you're listening to this, it will be today to go to um, the Battle of New Jersey, which is this big high school tournament that 
it's going to have a ton of future prospects. So, uh, I think I picked out my, my food spot. Hopefully I don't hit a ton of traffic so I can actually hit it and get that, that in for my next piece. But, uh, make sure you subscribe to no ceilings, for all of that. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast, rate review and share. Um, and the Tylers will be back this week tomorrow. If you're listening to this and, uh, that's it guys. We're out 2022. We're done. We'll see you in the new year. Let's go. We out. Peace. Peace.